Hey guys, Nintendo here. For the most part, game cartridges for any given platform are pretty much the same. Sure, there might be differences in storage or maybe a battery for saving games, but generally speaking, what you see is what you get. Which is why I find it so interesting when I discover a title that has a little extra hidden in that plastic shell. And we're not talking about hidden levels or cheat codes, I mean real physical differences inside the cartridge which change the game's overall functionality. It might make more sense if we just get into it. So enough intro, let's check it out. First up, I've got Space Invaders for the original Game Boy. A fairly standard title, pretty unassuming, but there's one feature that sets this game apart from the rest of the library. If you play the game on a regular Game Boy console, this is what you'll see. Like I said, it's about what you'd expect. A standard version of Taito's 1978 arcade classic with simple sounds and graphics. But where this one gets interesting is when it's used with a Super Game Boy cartridge. I'm sure most of you have seen these before, but for those who don't know, the Super Game Boy is an accessory that lets you play Game Boy games on the big screen with a Super Nintendo, and usually the games run exactly the same way as they would on the handheld. But with Space Invaders, we see something a little different. When playing this title through the Super Game Boy, a full Super Nintendo version of Space Invaders is unlocked and becomes playable. This expanded title, dubbed Space Invaders the Arcade Game, is complete with custom 16-bit graphics and animations, as well as enhanced stereo sound. And to be clear, this is not some secret game tucked away within the Super Game Boy itself. No, this entire Super Nintendo version is stored on that little Game Boy cartridge. When starting up the game, you can choose between playing either the Game Boy or Super Nintendo versions. So in effect, this one cartridge has two separate versions of the same title on one board. If you'd picked up this game secondhand, you'd never know about this extra feature. Next up, sticking with the Super Nintendo here, I have my personal favorite title on the platform, Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island. Now you're probably thinking, what sort of hidden feature could this game have? It's such a popular title, surely anything unique about this one would be public knowledge, right? Well, this one's a bit more of a passive addition to gameplay. Let me show you what I mean. Anytime you compare a console's launch titles with a game released later in its lifespan, you're bound to see a great deal of improvement just due to the nature of developers becoming more comfortable and experienced with the hardware. But take off the nostalgia glasses for just a moment and take a look at the difference between these two titles, the original Super Mario World on the left and Yoshi's Island over on the right. Yoshi's Island came out about four years later, so we would expect to see some visual improvements, but this is pretty extreme. We've got bigger sprites with more detail, background and foreground layers that make the levels pop, beautiful, fluid animations, and some pretty impressive pseudo-3D effects. So, how did Yoshi's Island pull off these advanced tricks? With an advanced graphics chip. If you've played Star Fox on the Super Nintendo, you're probably aware of the Super FX chip, which allowed the game to run rudimentary polygonal 3D graphics. Well, Yoshi's Island actually took advantage of a later version of the Super FX chip to handle sprite scaling, complex 2D and 3D rendering, and multiple foreground and background parallax layers for the illusion of depth. Unlike Star Fox, Yoshi's Island doesn't advertise that it uses the Super FX chip anywhere on its box or cartridge, so you wouldn't really know unless you were to open it up and examine the hardware. Okay, for the next game, we're gonna move over to the Nintendo DS and take a look at a very unique Pokemon title. This is Learn With Pokemon Typing Adventure. If you watched my earlier video about obscure DS peripherals, this one should look familiar. Learn With Pokemon Typing Adventure is an educational title exclusive to Europe, Japan, and Australia, which made use of a special wireless keyboard for the Nintendo DS. As the title indicates, it was designed to help kids learn how to type through more than 60 levels in which the player has to type specific words or phrases to capture Pokemon. Kind of like a bizarre crossover between Pokemon Snap and Typing of the Dead. The hidden feature that sets this cartridge apart from the others in the DS library has to do with the wireless keyboard itself. While you might have assumed that it would use the DS's local wireless technology, like any standard title with download play or programs like PictoChat, the Nintendo wireless keyboard actually runs on Bluetooth and can be used with any number of compatible devices like smartphones and PCs. But you might recognize a problem there. The original DS didn't have any sort of Bluetooth support. So, in order to bridge the gap, Nintendo actually embedded a custom Bluetooth adapter inside the cartridge. When the game starts up, the system will automatically attempt to pair with the keyboard, and if the connection is made, the game will continue as normal. And as far as I know, this is the only DS game to have that sort of functionality. Pretty cool. Okay, next up is Gyromite for the NES. 
Of course, Gyromite was one of two titles sold for use with Rob, the robotic operating buddy. The gameplay is pretty simple. You control a scientist named Professor Hector and must make your way through each level avoiding enemies and disarming bundles of dynamite. To get through each environment, you'll have to pass through a series of blue and red gates, and this is where Rob comes in. Using the robot to place a gyro on either the red or blue pedestals will activate all the gates of the same color in-game. But that special functionality is not what we're talking about here. Gyromite's hidden feature is instead a product of the situation surrounding its launch. You see, Gyromite was one of 17 NES launch titles released in October of 1985, and at the time Nintendo was struggling to have the game ready for store shelves before the holiday season. Of course, the system had already come out two months prior in Japan, so they were sitting on a ton of Japanese copies which were ready to go, and in order to hit their deadline, Nintendo opted to put Famicom cartridge boards inside NES plastic shells to speed up the production process and push out that first wave of launch titles. Only problem is, Famicom games have 60 connector pins, whereas NES titles have 72. So what did Nintendo do to solve this problem? They included a 60-pin to 72-pin converter inside the cartridges themselves. These converters are the only accessories of their kind to be officially produced by Nintendo, and can be modified to work with any Famicom title for use in an American NES console. And as you might have guessed, the original Famicom boards inside these early Gyromite carts will work just fine in a Japanese Famicom system as well. In reality, Gyromite is not the only title which was affected by the shortage. While Gyromite is one of the most common games with the accessory, any title from the Black Box series could potentially have a Famicom converter inside. Here's how to tell. First, make sure you've got your hands on one of those early NES titles with the standard black label. They're pretty recognizable, they should look something like this. After that, take a look at the top of the cartridge and see if you find any plastic tabs holding the shell together. A game with plastic tabs is going to be your standard cartridge with three security screws, and these came later in the life of the NES, so they won't have what you're looking for. If you find a cart without these tabs, it should have five standard flathead screws instead. That's what you want to see. Finally, take a look at the connector pins at the bottom. You should see some little teeth coming off of each pin where the board was cut out from its material. And these teeth will either be in the center of each pin or off to the side. If they're in the middle, you've got a regular US copy. But if they're over to the side, chances are you've found a Famicom adapter. Finally, for the last game on this list, we're going to step away from the world of Nintendo for just a moment to take a look at Sonic 3D Blast for Sega Genesis. This one might be a bit of a stretch, but I felt that the story behind this hidden feature was too interesting to pass up. If you're unfamiliar with the game, Sonic 3D Blast was a top-down isometric platformer developed by Traveler's Tales and released in 1996. Although the game was met with mixed reviews, it definitely has a bit of a following, and sports a distinct 90s aesthetic with its pseudo-3D perspective. However, longtime Sonic fans may be surprised to learn that Sonic 3D Blast has a secret hidden level select. It's not accessed with some secret code or with any other kind of special input. No, to unlock this feature, you have to hit the cartridge while the game is running. Yes, physically knock the cartridge out of place. Try this at your own risk. While the level select itself is plenty intriguing, I think the story behind its inclusion is even more surprising. Developer John Burton recounts in a video on his channel that during the development, he had a brilliant idea to guarantee the title would make it through Sega's submission process. By catching any and all runtime errors, such as Division by Zero or an illegal instruction, John was able to redirect the game to this otherwise inaccessible debug menu to gracefully cover up the underlying problem. That's right, this hidden feature was born out of an effort to trick the Sega Quality Assurance team if the game were to crash during the approval process. And it worked! It was years later that fans rediscovered this hidden menu by abusing their Genesis consoles and causing the game to crash by briefly interrupting the connection between the cartridge and the system. Pretty crazy. If you think that's cool, I highly recommend you check out John's channel, Game Hut, for more programming secrets from the early days of Sega. There's some really cool info over there, and as usual, I'll leave a link in the description below. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed this look at a few game cartridges with hidden features. Let me know down in the comments if you'd like to see more like this one, and I might have to do some sort of a part two. Of course, if you did like the video, please consider subscribing to Nintendrew for all sorts of cool gaming content, and make sure to share it with any friends who might find it interesting. It really helps out the channel more than you can imagine. Otherwise, I'll see you next time. Bye! Hey guys, thanks again for watching and for making it all the way to the end of the video. If you like this one, here are two more videos you might like as well. 
As always, if you like what I do and would like to help out the channel, I've got a link to my Patreon on the right side of your screen. And otherwise, I hope you look forward to the next one. Take care!